Boom. All right. <clears throat> okay. I don't think I need this. Can you guys hear me okay? Hear me all right? Okay, cool. All right. Okay. How are you guys doing today? Doing all right? How are you doing? Doing all right? Yeah. Yeah, we've been praying for you. I've had a lot better days. A lot better, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. We're praying for you. Way, JC, way to go being dead. dad. That is awesome. We're behind you. Tonight, we're going to be talking about, there's a principle. Um applies in our relationship with God. And the principle is is that uh, the, the, our relationship with Jesus it's a workout. It's a workout. What that means is it doesn't mean that, that, uh, that we work to get a relationship with Jesus. It means that when we begin a relationship with Jesus it's um, God he starts leading us through things. It's kind of like going to the gym. You know, when you go to the gym, you know it's good for you. You know it's going to. <laughs> so, so, so some people say. <laughs> you know that that if you work out, if you do the cardio and 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 you 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 uh, lift the weights, that your body's going to get stronger. You're you're going to lose some weight, and you're going to feel better. You're going to be healthier, and it's going to make the rest of your life better. And, uh, well, our walk with Jesus is a lot like that. It's a lot like, like working out. And, and we have, um, uh, and Jesus, he loves us so much. God loves us so much that when we begin a relationship with him, if we don't choose to go to the gym and begin to work out that relationship, work out the salvation that he has begun in us, what he does is he goes, okay, well, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm going to take you to the gym anyway. <laughs> And we're going to work this out. And so sometimes things hit us in life that just kind of seem to blindside us or hit us, hit us sideways. And we don't know what's going on. But as believers, we can know this, that God is working all things for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. And so everything that we, we come across as believers, everything that we come across as believers... God is using it to work out the salvation that he's begun in us. Okay, that, and, and, and what I mean by that is, this is what uh, Paul said in Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 says, Therefore, my beloved, and by the way, Paul is in prison, right? As he's penning this letter, Paul the Apostle is in prison and he's chained to a Roman guard. There's a Roman guard sitting right next to him. And he's writing to the church that he planted in Philippi. People that have come to know Jesus through Paul's preaching and a church began. And there's this church, and Paul is writing to them. And he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But he doesn't stop there. He says, For it is, it is God who works in you both, to will and to do for his good pleasure. Paul is telling the Philippians, the church in Philippi, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So here's what we can gather from this as believers, those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus, have begun a relationship. There, there's a starting point. When 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 you, when you came to God and you called out to him and confessed your sin and, and he revealed that, that he had forgiveness for you through his blood and it began, all of a sudden your eyes were opened and you began to, to know that, wow, God is there and, and he's working in my life. Well, what he's done, what he did is he began a salvation process in your life. 
And then what Paul is saying is that God started this salvation process in your life, and he, he is working in you his will. He says, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So the salvation that God put in your heart is for eternity. It's for eternity to live with him forever. But it's not just for eternity. It's also for this life right now. To work out God's will in your life for his good pleasure. It's his will that he is working out. So going back to, to the gym. Okay, and, and I've never been, you know, I shot horses for 15 years. I grew up on a ranch. Uh, I mean, I, when, I was, uh, when I was in high school, you know, all the football players are like big into the gym. You know, who could bench press the most, you know. And, and there's a lot of guys that got really stout and stuff. You know, as you could tell, like I never really, you know, got very far down that road. <laughs> but, um, but you know what it's like to, to work out. You know what it's like to... Um, uh, to go through the pain and um, uh, and uh, to 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 get something better, to go through the pain to get something better, and um, and so that's that's something that um, we're going to look at how God works it in. God works His salvation in you, and then we work it out. We work out God's salvation with fear and trembling. And so we're going to, so, you know, think about the, the 3,000. Um, the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. You remember the, when Peter was preaching the first sermon, okay? Jesus had, by, at this point, Jesus had rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven. And he made a promise to his disciples. He said, hey, on this day, 50 days, okay, on, on the day of Pentecost, stay here, right here in Jerusalem, and they come. The comforter, uh, your advocate, he's going to come. I'm sending you someone. And so they're waiting, and it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes down on the disciples at that point. And there's all kinds of crazy stuff. There's there's uh, tongues as a fire over their heads and all of these things, and, and they're they're speaking in different languages. Okay? And and there's people around and and uh, that see this happening and they're going, what is going on with these guys? They look like, you know, one guy says, hey, I mean, did you guys start drinking early this morning? Like, it looks like you're drunk already. And But Peter, he begins to preach the first sermon and, and, uh, and the first gospel message. And that day, 3,000 were saved. And, and you know what? As when we read that 2,000 years later, we can easily think that Peter just walked out on the street and preached to uh, thousands of people that maybe he had not seen before or just passed her by. But here's, here's something you have to know about the background. Is for the last three years, those same people had been to Pentecost every year. Those same people would travel all over and they would go to Pentecost. And then, and that there were, which was a feast. And then they would go to the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. Okay, and who was doing ministry those three and a half years? It was Jesus. Jesus was doing ministry, and they saw Jesus healing people, and they saw Jesus making the blind see, and they saw Jesus making the lame walk, and they saw all these things. And then Jesus during Passover, that's the feast in the spring. During Passover is when Jesus died on the cross. They were there. They were there in Jerusalem, these same people that are hearing Peter's message. And so during all of that whole time that these 3,000 people, this huge number that make a decision to ask Jesus to make Jesus their Lord and Savior that day and enter into the church and the Holy Spirit enters into them. Okay, it wasn't just this all of a sudden thing. We have to remember that those people had been watching this process of Jesus's ministry and it all culminated Jesus he had set this moment up for Peter to preach this message he had set this whole thing up for this moment for the beginning of the church Jesus he was the hinge from the old covenant to the new covenant okay and so just like that just like the 3,000 people you know what 
you're not going to just all of a sudden just come to know Jesus. The Bible says God draws a man to himself like, like water is drawn out of a well. And so what that means, whether you know it or not, before you ever made a decision for Jesus, or if you're here and maybe you haven't made a decision for Jesus, even before that moment happens, God is working in your life. And he's doing a work. And there's things that maybe you've never connected the dots before, but there's things where his hand is moving and his hand is working. And his ministry is that the Holy Spirit is actually working in your life and around your life. And you're seeing these things happen. But, it doesn't, but it's leading up to something. And what that is, is it's Jesus. He was, he was working in okay, the salvation okay, into these people. Now, there were a lot more on that day of Pentecost when 3,000 people made a decision to follow Jesus as Peter preached. There was tens of thousands of people around there. You know, 3,000 seems like a big number to us, but but uh, a lot of scholars uh, agree that there were uh, more than a million people are in Jerusalem during those feast days. Maybe not so much in, in Pentecost, but during those feast days, there's tens and tens of thousands of people all around. But those people, those 3,000, they had, they had already, there is already a work that had been done in them to where they had seen things happen. And what that was, was God was doing this work where he was planting these seeds, and they eventually they came to fruition. So, what kind of things has God been doing in your life that makes you start thinking about him? and makes you start to realize your need a savior. See, the only reason we choose to accept a savior, the only reason we choose to accept the savior, is because we recognize our need for him. And that was what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, was he said, hey, Jesus, he willingly took the cross, but it was you that crucified him. And when they heard the message that that they had put their own Savior to death, they were cut to the heart. And that was the Holy Spirit. That was the Holy Spirit that cut to their heart. And that's the same thing that happens in our lives, is that God is, as he's working this salvation, this is the first process, is that we're cut to the heart with the sin, our own sin, and rejection of the Savior. And they ask this question, what must we do? And Peter says this, in Acts uh, 2, chapter 2, verses 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent. Repent. Every, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, God working, we're talking about God working salvation into us, okay? And one of the first things that we have to do, and this is what the 3,000, the first things that we have to do for God to work this, his salvation into our hearts before we can begin to work it out is we have to be open to the Holy Spirit. If we're not open to the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit convictions come, when the, Holy, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes... What happens is it just deflects right off. Jesus told the parable of the four different types of ground, which, which were hearts. Uh, one, was, one was rocky ground. One, one was thorny ground. And when the, when the seed fell on the rocky ground and it started to sprout, but it had no root because of the rocks. And then there was the thorny ground. When the seed fell on it, it began to sprout, but the, the thorns choked it out. Those are the cares of life. Okay? And then there was, there was the good ground, which the seed fell on, and it began to sprout, and it, and it grew roots. And because it grew roots, it began to grow fruit. Okay, but then he said, there's the rocky, there's the, there's the road. The seed fell on the hard ground. And what that is, the hard ground is the heart that is rock solid like flint. The heart that says to God, 
I'm doing my thing. I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. I don't need any help. I'm doing just fine. And so when the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes on that heart, the devil is right there just to pull the seed away. Okay, and the seed never gets into that heart. And so that's the first thing that we have to be, is that we have to be, we have to be open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We have to be open to the Spirit's work in our life, which means that, that he's going to convict us of sin, okay? And, and uh, with, which, uh, which is going to prompt us to seek an answer for it, okay? And you know what? One, one, one thing about the hard heart, the heart of Flint, is that um, uh, it doesn't have any, any problem with sin whatsoever. It can sin all day long, reject God all day long, and no problems. So that's a hard heart, but the heart that's open, the heart that is open to receive the conviction of the Spirit, oh, feels that, wow, feels feels how far away from God I am. Feels just, oh, how the blackness, feels the heavy weight of sin. And, it's, and, and that's the process. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. That's a beautiful thing because that heavy weight of sin, what it's doing, it's drawing us to the Savior, Jesus Christ, to work that salvation in us. And so Peter, he says, For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day there were about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And so, so there's a point to where it begins to, what God has worked in you, there becomes this switch to where we have this work out, to work out the salvation that God has worked and willed in us. Okay, and this is um, uh, this is where we have to be diligent to His word. That's what Peter he says. With many other words, he testified and exhorted, saying, "Be saved from this perverse generation." Okay, and they verse two forty two. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Okay, and so um, what we we there's two things that we have to do is that that to work out this to have a good workout, and that is to be diligent in His Word. Have to be diligent to continue steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine. And you know what? We have everything of the Apostles' doctrine that they have on that day, on that when the church. On the birthday of the church, when the church began, they had the Apostles' Doctrine. That was those who had been with Jesus for three and a half years that Jesus had trained personally and said, Okay, you're the guy, you guys are the ones that are going to lead the church. Well, right here is the New Testament. The New Testament is the Apostles' Doctrine. And so what that means to continue in the Apostles' Doctrine daily, once salvation has been worked in our hearts and we are to be diligent to be in his word. And it's only through being diligent in his word and continuing steadfastly with his people that this salvation process begins to work out. We're going to look, I'm, let, let's look at, uh, we're going to look at Paul's life. Because Paul, you know, Paul was a radical dude. One thing I love about Paul is that he was an all the way kind of guy. Whatever direction he was going, he was going 110 miles an hour. We're going this this way. Let's go all the way. Well, Paul, he was raised. He was raised a Jew. He was ra he was in the in, in the family of Benjamin, and he um, uh, he had he was raised with money. His family had money, and so they were able to get him an education. Not only did they give him the best education that money could buy in that day, but also he was born a Roman citizen. So basically, he had everything that could possibly be given that you could be born into in that day, from a Jewish perspective. And 
And Paul, uh, uh, growing up, Paul was, he was the guy, as you, re as you read through Acts, you come across a situation to where we read about Stephen, the first martyr. A martyr is a person that dies for a cause. Uh, and uh, uh, a martyr for Jesus is someone that, it, that dies because they stand for Jesus, because they confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So, so as the church began, all these people are coming to know Jesus. They're coming to be saved, and it's really changing the dynamics of, of what it means to be a Jew during that time. And there's all this craziness going on. And so then there are people that raise up, that, that started raising up and saying, hey, this is a problem. These Christians are a problem. We need to deal with them. Here's the best way we can deal with them. We'll arrest them. We'll throw them in jail, and we'll kill them. And and there were and there were Jews that they hated everything that Jesus stood for. They hated what the new covenant meant because it meant losing what they had and in being a Jew. And so one day Stephen he gets in a conversation with some of these guys that hate what Christians stand for. That hate what Jesus is all about. And they start talking. Well, well, Stephen, he begins to preach them a sermon. Okay? And uh, he, he begins to preach them a sermon. And eventually they get, get to a point to where they are so angry. They're gnashing their teeth. They're stomping, they're stomping their ears. They're screaming. They can't stand the message that Stephen is preaching. He's preaching the name that salvation comes through the name of Jesus Christ and no other way, and they cannot stand it other. And so they decide that they're going to stone him right then. And when they they stone him, this is what they did in that day: is that they would have a witness, because you know, according to the law, you needed a witness, a witness to say, "Yep, this was the they, they stoned him for this reason." And it wasn't just an outlaw deal. And so what they would do is they would load, lay their cloaks because you couldn't really throw real good with a big old cloak on, right? So you got to take your cloak off before so you could really smash someone, someone's head in good. So they laid their cloaks down at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Saul, who then later his, became Paul, which was his Gentile. And Saul, the coats were laid there at Saul's feet. And Saul witnessed the very first person that died for Jesus' name. As they stoned him and as they killed Stephen. Now, at Paul, as, as, as he has this education, he has Roman citizenship, he has everything. He goes on to dedicate his whole life to stomping out this Jewish sect called Christianity, This Jewish sect called the way, these followers of Jesus, he's going to stomp them out because they're a black spot on Judaism. And so he begins to go do that. And, and Saul, he's a Saul Paul. He's an all the way guy. And so he, did, he drops everything and he's getting letters from the rulers and he's going out. He's knocking on doors. He, he's investigating. He's doing everything that he can to find everybody that confesses the name of Jesus to arrest them, to put them in jail, and to put them to death. We need to stomp out this, this sect. Well, one day, Saul has some papers in his hand. He has some people that he needs to arrest going to Damascus. And so he's on the road. He's on the road to Damascus, and that's where we pick up. Let's look at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if the... If he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? 
Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias! And he said, Yes, here I am. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Are you sure about this? <laughs> Ananias is going, man, I, I, I know some names of this dude threw in jail. Are you sure you want me to go to this guy's house? Ananias said, verse 14, And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on his name. But the Lord answered to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name for Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And I, Ananias went his way, he entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in synagogues, and he, that he is the Son of God. Wow. Now that's a turnaround. <laughs> that's a change of direction. And Paul, you know what, his personality didn't change at all. Saul's personality. He, had, he was going on the road to Damascus to arrest Christians. Jesus met him right there on the road to Damascus. And immediately, as soon as his belief system was straightened out, as soon as God... Put, as soon as Paul realized Jesus is the Savior. Now, the education that Paul had, it, it wouldn't take a split second to realize when Jesus said, I am the Lord whom you are persecuting. It wouldn't take a split second for Paul. In his mind, he would be running through all of the symbolism of the Old Testament and what that meant. Of the sacrificial system. It would, it would be running through his mind of the lamb that was slain and the picture that that was of the Messiah to come and how the Jews every year would be looking forward. Is the Messiah coming this year? Is he coming this year? Every year we have an empty seat at the seat of Passover for the, for the Messiah that's going to come. The Messiah will waiting for the Messiah to come. Immediately, it would just be a split second for all of those things that come all whoosh, together and and. Saul would go, oh, crap. <laughs> I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> but you know what? Saul, he never stopped going 90 miles an hour. <laughs> he never stopped going 90 miles an hour. As soon as that salvation was worked in his heart, as soon as he realized Jesus is the Lord, the Christ, he's the one that I need to put my trust in, okay, let's go. Let's do this thing. Let's go. And immediately, he's going, okay, what do we need to do to figure this out? So, let's look at what steps that he took to begin to work out that salvation that God had worked in him. The very first thing is, is Jesus told him, go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Here's what's going to happen. When that clicks that Jesus is God, that he is your Lord and your Savior, and he's the one that you must bow your life to, immediately he's going to give you a word. He's going to give you something to do. And uh, here's the thing about 
you know, we can see, like, Paul's life, in a matter of five days, he did what the average American Christian does in about 40 years. <laughs> I, I, that might, might sound harsh, but, you know, uh, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> so, but within a, within a amount of five days, we see these steps that he took, and that, you know what? We, we, it doesn't have to take us 40 years to do what Paul did in five days. We can do them just as fast as Paul did and get just as far as Paul did within the short amount of time. And so as soon as Jesus spoke to him, go into the city, this is what you must do. That's what he did. Immediately, the people that are around him said, I can't see. You need to take my hand. You need to take me into the city. God has something. And what that means is that faith without works is dead. What this meant when Paul went into the city to wait to be told what he must do, it, mean that it meant that he believed the Lord. When God tells you to do something, this is your first opportunity to show that you believe him is by doing what he tells you to do. That's what faith is. So then Saul rose from the ground. They, they brought him to Damascus. Okay, he rose from the ground, and so he was obedient. He was obedient to the to the word that he heard, and so that's that's where that faith comes in is that obedience. Then, verse in verse nine says that he was three days without sight. Here's the next thing that's going to happen in your relationship with Jesus. Or the next thing in this process in this relationship with Jesus is he's going to tell you to do something that you have to that you need to be obedient to for him to be your Lord and Savior. But guess what? You're not going to know what's going to happen when you do it. Paul was three days without sight. And what that means is that when Jesus is going to ask you to do something, you're going to be completely blind in the situation. And it can look really, really bad. You know, I mean, Paul was arresting people. And he was putting people in jail. You know, he didn't know the love of Christ. He didn't know the love of believers. And so imagine being in Paul's shoes, walking into Damascus blind, not being able to see. Someone could club him right over the head real easy. Be like, I'll take care of this Saul dude. If believers didn't have the love of Christ in them. <laughs> that's what Saul was walking into. And he was walking completely blind. And that's something that... To be obedient to God is that, is that you're going to know that it's him, and then you're going to know it's his word, and that he's asked you to do it, but you're not going to know the outcome. Okay, You're going to be blind, and you're going to need people to lead you by the hand to help you to get there. And that's what the family of God is for. And then in verse 17, it says, Through... Um, so, uh, so Jesus had sent Ananias. Ananias, he comes to Paul. Ananias, he lays his hand on Paul, prays for him, be healed, receive the Holy Spirit. The scale, something like scales fall from his eyes. The Holy Spirit enters. At, uh, uh, there's this work of the Holy Spirit flooding through Paul. Okay? And um, receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is, this is the next step of the process is that you're going to be in this place in life. You're not going to know what's going to happen, but you know Jesus is calling you to do it. And then the next thing is, is that um, uh, you're not going to be able to get to grow anymore until you get plugged in with God's people. See, this is how God designed the church. God designed the church. We are the churches, the body of Christ. It's those who have been called out of the world into Christ. And so what that means is that, is that the healing that you're waiting for, or the help that you're waiting for, or the, the sight that you're waiting for, it's waiting for you through God's people. And so as you begin to grow with God's people, as you begin to get plugged into the body of Christ, God begins to help you. He begins to give you what you need through his people. 
and he designed it that way. We're designed to where I need you and you need me. You know, Jesus, he could have said, okay, Paul, go here, and in three days, I'll heal you of your sight. You'll get your sight back. But he didn't. He chose Ananias. He chose Ananias to physically go to Paul. And, you know, Jesus said, could have said, in three days, you're going to get your sight, and then I'm going to fill you with the Spirit. But he did it. Ananias. And so there's going to be, your next growing process is going to be, can't be done without the fellowship of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the, and the gifts that they have to help you and to grow you. Then the next thing, um, he arose and was baptized. Paul responded to God's work in his heart. Immediately there was a response. And um, uh, then in verse 19 it says, Saul spent some days with the disciples. Okay? He connected with God's people. He spent some time with them. And that, that's something that, that we as believers, as the body of Christ, were called to spend time with each other. Not just here at church. Here, here's the, you know, the church was actually not designed or ever meant to do this. You notice how all of you are sitting in the same direction, and you're all facing this direction? <laughs> that church was never actually designed that way. Jesus didn't say, okay, this is what you're going to do, disciples. This is what you're going to do, Peter, James, and John. You're, you're going to build a building. And then you're going to put a bunch of benches all in a row. Mm -hmm. And then one of you will speak to all the rest of you. <laughs> that, Jesus never gave that command. He did say, go preach the gospel and make disciples. Okay? And so, actually, the connection with the body of Christ that we need is not going to be here. We all need to be here. You need to be here to get God's word, to expand your mind, to challenge you, okay? to push you further. But the real fellowship and connection that you need, it's not going to be found sitting all in one direction looking at one guy. It's going to be connecting with God's people in his word. That's right, DC. Yeah. It's going to be going, hey, let's hang out. And oh yeah, this is what God's doing in my life. What's God doing in your life? That's the connection. That's the hanging out. Paul, he spent days with the disciples, just hanging out with them, just being there. I'm sure they had some conversations. Can you imagine a conversation? Oh yeah, I'm sorry I put your sister in jail. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> but I do now. Will you forgive me? <laughs> and we need, we need that kind of fellowship to where we're connecting beyond once a week. Where we're connecting outside in the world. So he, he, um, he spent some days with the disciples, connect to God's people. Then in verse, verse twenty, okay. So, so there's these, there's these steps. Let's go back over, over them. There's trusting, okay, trusting Christ, believing Him, and walking in obedience to His word, okay, even when you don't see the outcome, and connecting with His people. Responding to God's work in your heart, okay, uh, in fellowship, then when, when these things are at work and you're walking in these things, here's what happens next. The next thing that happens is that you begin to fulfill God's calling on your life. It's an amazingly simple recipe. You can do, take your calendar. And divide all your time. And I, and I guarantee this is what's going to happen when you do these things. When you hear the Lord, you're obedient to his word. You respond to his work in your heart. And you spend time with his people. You will begin to understand and fulfill your call. And this is what happened with Paul. After all of these things... So read verse 20. It says, Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. This was Paul's call. This is what Paul was called to do. Or Saul. Saul who became Paul. Because he wasn't the preacher to the Jews. 
God called him. His calling specifically was to preach to the Gentiles. Even though he had a heart for his brothers, the Jews, not his brothers in Christ, but his brothers by blood, he had a heart for them. And he would always go to the synagogues first because he loved the Jews, but Jesus had called him to the Gentiles. And so that's where the fruit would come from, is when Paul preached to the Gentiles. And immediately he went to the synagogues and he preached the Christ. He fulfilled his calling. As God had done a work of salvation in his heart, he worked out the salvation. He worked out that salvation, and this is the place that you will God wants you to get to is to this place of fulfilling the call that he has on your life. Now, not everybody is called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Some, some people are called to have mercy. That's a spiritual gift and it's a calling. Some people are called to, to administrate. Some people are called to give. Some people are called to have compassion. Some people are called to see the needy and go to them. Every, we all have these different callings, and as the body of Christ, each person has a part. Each person has a part to play, and that's where God wants to grow you to. That's where he wants to get you to, is to where you're fulfilling your calling, but it's not going to happen unless we work out the salvation in fear and trembling that God has already worked in. It takes working out. It takes sweat. It takes blood. It takes Diligence. It takes getting up early and going to the gym. You know what? It, it takes. I would rather go watch a movie, or I would. I would rather. I would rather go on a bike ride. But you know what? I need to go spend time with my brother in Christ. I need to go spend time with my sister in Christ. It means that diligent work. We're working to make sure that we're plugged into each other. And, um, and into his word. So, fulfilling your calling. That's, um, that's what God made you. You were made to worship him. But if you're, you know, when you think of worship, what do you think of? Do you think of like a bunch of people like singing? You know, we call it worship. Know, when we like when we stand and sing, we, we go, let's worship the Lord. That is worship. But that's just a little, very small portion of what worship actually is. Worship is everything that you think that you say that you do in your life. That's worship. And here's the deal is we can we can honor ourselves in what we say, what we think, what we do, or we can honor God. We can worship God in everything. And if we are made to worship Him and we can, you can think of it like this. God made you a butterfly to fly. God made a butterfly to fly. He made an eagle to fly. He made a, a frog to jump. He made a fish to swim. Okay, well, he made people. What did he make people up for? To reflect him. To worship him. To honor him in everything that we think, that we say, and that we do. And so, there was, um, there was a guy that uh, he was... Um, Sitting, he was in a hospital, and he was, uh, so he was on bed rest for a while, and he was going to get better and everything, but he was there for a while, and, and he noticed that uh, every day, he, he noticed that this uh, little caterpillar crawling and uh, stopped on his window sill, and then the caterpillar began to make a cocoon, and he was really interested, and he really enjoyed watching the caterpillar begin making this cocoon, you know, and it made this cocoon. And he, and then after a few days, began to see that this, uh, uh, that the cocoon began to get a little crack in it. And then he saw, he saw this little, little head poke out. And it wasn't the caterpillar anymore; it was a butterfly. And the butterfly it was, it was squeezing and it was pushing and it was pushing through this cocoon. And the cocoon didn't just break open and then all of a sudden this butterfly pop out. It was just. The struggle that this butterfly was having to go through. So the man thought, oh man, I I hope that butterfly makes it. Maybe what I should do is I should just break the cocoon open to let the butterfly. Well, when he did, when he broke the cocoon open, the butterfly never flew. Because here's what it takes for a butterfly to fly. 
is the butterfly has to struggle through the small opening of the cocoon to push the blood into the wings to grow the wings. Here's the deal is the salvation that God has worked in your heart, it's going to be a struggle to push through. We start as worms. <laughs> David said, oh God, we are just a worm. <laughs> We're dirt. That's what we are. But God has made us eternal. And he's made us with wings to fly. He's made us in his image to be, to reflect his glory. And so what is the struggle? What's the struggle in your life that you're going to have to push through? What it is, it's the struggle that God is allowing you to go through to grow your wings so that you can fly, so that you can do, you can fulfill your calling, you can do what you're called to do, what he's made you to do, and enjoy it forever in eternity with him. You're made to fly. You're made to be victorious. You're made to be triumphant. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation separate us from the love of Christ? Or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. God has a plan. He's worked a salvation into you that you have to begin to work out in fear and trembling through the struggles, through every single struggle that comes your way. And, and I don't know where everybody is here tonight, whether you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus. But I want to give anyone an opportunity that if the Holy Spirit is giving you that conviction in your heart, that wow. I know my sin is real and it's weighing heavy on me and I know I don't know what to do but I know I need a savior you can ask him into your life you can ask him into your heart all you have to do is to open your heart to him admit your sin just bring that weight and that blackness of sin lift it up to him and trust Trust that his blood has covered every single sin and that he will carry you and ask him to come into your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for being with us and thank you for your word. And Lord, we want to be um, a people that work out that salvation that you've worked in us. And um, Lord, help us to, to be Lord, I pray that by your spirit you lead us, that you guide us, and, uh, and that you grow us, and that we grow together, Lord, that we all find out.